Ah, shit. Here we go again. I've once again found myself in Bikini Bottom, and the only way I can go home is by talking about another Spongebob game in extensive detail. Th that's... that's the lore now. Look it up. But thankfully I know just what to talk about this time. That being Spongebob's one and only outing in the party genre, 2005's Lights, Camera, Pants. The last of the three Spongebob games that I owned and played the hell out of during my childhood. As a Mario Party kid, I had no issues getting into this game and appreciated it for being a fun deviation from the norm while also enjoying how enveloped it was in the Spongebob brand. Many years later, and I still really, really like it. Yeah, no joke. Lights, Camera, Pants is a fun time. It's got some problems and isn't quite on the level of the best Spongebob game, but it's still pretty great as both a licensed party game, which is quite a feat on its own, and as a Spongebob game, and I'm going to spend however long talking about it. This video is going to be a bit different from the Heavy Iron videos, there's not going to be a build up to some big thesis statement about this game, but I still really wanted to talk about this one and why I like it so much. This is a retrospective of Spongebob Squarepants Lights Camera Pants. As per usual, we're kicking off with the story, which is certainly a point of interest that scholars discuss in great detail when on the topic of kids' party games. I've said this before, but the point of a story in a game is to motivate the player and give reason for the gameplay, but not all genres need the same level of storytelling. Visual novels, for instance, rarely have anything resembling gameplay, so you're going to need grade-A narrative and characters to keep a player hooked. RPGs can and have been carried by their gameplay, but because of how relatively long they are compared to games from other genres, they're widely recognized for telling some great stories to help prevent the battling and exploration from getting too repetitive or unrewarding. Even a simple collectathon platformer needs to give you some justification for the shopping list of random collectibles you're tasked to grab, because otherwise, what's the point? Party games, meanwhile, are quite comfortable in the category I like to call. Story is not at all necessary, but nice to have anyway. Right along with racing games and sports games. People come to these games to play, maybe compete with friends or family, and have fun. No one's coming here to ask, why are Mario and Bowser comfortable joyriding together? Because of that, a non-existent plot really wouldn't be a stain on a game from these genres. But regardless of that lack of expectations, plenty of these games still try to offer something, and I appreciate it. Some will have a single-player adventure mode of some kind, others will throw a cutscene before the start screen to give players... something? Mario Party does that a lot. They usually have a short but very memorable introduction that tells us why we're throwing a party, be it relaxation, recollection, resolution, or declaration of war. With all that in mind, Lights, Camera, Pants wouldn't require much in the story department. It could have just been a standard minigame collection with no story to speak of. It could have thrown together a single cutscene to give us some loose connecting tissue between all the minigames. Instead of taking that heavily tread path though, LCP instead doubles down on the story and turns it into one of the game's most defining aspects, and in my opinion, it worked out wonderfully. The concept alone is brilliant. Gil Hammerstein here is the director of the new adventures of Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy show, and he's working on an upcoming special with filming taking place right in Bikini Bottom. There's numerous minor roles that need to be filled, and his talent scouts have set up all manner of challenges disguised as auditions for the locals to prove themselves in. With Spongebob, Patrick, Sandy, Squidward, Mr. Krabs, and Plankton all eager for the spotlight, not only are they competing for every small role, but for the role of supervillain. As the one with the highest cumulative score across all auditions will have the honor of playing the special's main antagonist, the Sneaky Hermit. This is one of the most unique ideas I've seen for a party game, and it makes everything that happens feel completely natural. Usually the minigames in party games are just kind of there and don't have an in-universe explanation, which is fine. I'm not knocking stuff like Mario Party for not explaining stuff like this, but it's so cool seeing a party game with a more involved story have a perfect reason for the minigames to be where they are and what they are. As far as the actual special is concerned, it's another really fun idea. Our superheroes out of retirement have been framed for the disappearance of the Saiyan Stadium and set out to find whoever was really behind it. Along the way, they pick up a hint that it could be the work of a greedy, building-snatching mad crab called the Sneaky Hermit, and run to many different faces, some who mislead them and others who point them on the right track. This eventually leads to an uneasy alliance between them, Man Ray, and the Dirty Bubble, who were also wronged by the Crustacean, where they work together to put a stop to the Hermit. This isn't high art by any means, but it's a great idea for a Mermaid Man episode, and considering how little we see of their show from the series, I'm perfectly happy that we got a game that decided to focus on this element as much as it did. However, for as great as I think this game's story and the story within the story are in concept, I think it absolutely kills it in terms of execution, courtesy of its fan service, humor, and the replay value that comes from it. Each of the talent scouts are recognizable side characters and even one-offs from the show's first three seasons. 
Anyone could have expected characters like Larry the Lobster or Mrs. Puff to get in, but then we get the likes of Squilliam, Kevin the Sea Cucumber, Bubble Bass, and even Cannonball Jenkins. And it's just really nice to see these characters in a game, even if they don't have that much screen time. They all have their own flavor of back and forth of Gil, ranging from swapping pleasantries, to the host getting super into their challenges and Gil having to keep them on track, or them becoming increasingly annoying for Gil to deal with. It's always either very charming or very funny. And yeah, unsurprisingly, the Spongebob Party game is pretty funny. To the point where I'd honestly call this the funniest Spongebob game I've talked about so far. Big statement I realize, but I've got my evidence. If the minigames themselves aren't getting me to chuckle, then the various character quips usually pull through, where they're either boasting, putting down other competitors, or bemoaning a loss. They admittedly can mouth off a little too much at times, but if I had to choose between this or them not talking at all, I definitely prefer the former. And the episode itself is pretty comedic throughout. I've never not loved watching the dynamic between Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy in the show itself, and it's really no different here. Mermaid Man still swings between very heroic and very senile, sometimes both at the same time, and it's great when put alongside Barnacle Boy, who plays the somewhat grumpy straight man to his antics and helps to make sure he stays on track. I'll have a burger and fries! I mean, unhand that captive, you vile fiends! And for all the problems and grief they give the other, it's very clear these two are best friends for life for a reason. And when they're not making me laugh, they're usually making me smile a very genuine heartwarming smile. Man Ray and the Dirty Bubble are also really fun throughout, and mostly remind me of how they were portrayed in Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy 5. Campy, goofy villains who choose to spend their time committing petty misdemeanors, which is something I always get a laugh out of. And unsurprisingly, their team up with the heroes is one of the highlights of the episode, where they have just the right amount of friction with each other, and it's something I wish got a little more screen time because it really was great. That's just one highlight though. The other is undoubtedly the various roles filled in by the playable characters. Each character in every role exudes that perfect balance of actively trying to act while their personality keeps seeping through the role. And there are so many possible lines and scenes I could use to show that. The optimistic and enthusiastic yet inexperienced performance of Spongebob. They have arrested Mermaid Man for my crimes. Which doesn't sound fair really, but ah, I am a super villain. The logic leaping, eyebrow raising non sequiturs of Patrick. The monster who killed the butler could be in this very room. The deep fried confidence and attitude of Sandy. Couple of super people. Creator with the cone. What a swan, I saw some oldies. The part time fame seeking, full time snarking of Squidward. Join the police force, they said. Exciting live of action, they said. The stern, money hungry axe from Mr. Krabs. There's a fee for making dramatic announcements! Oh. And Plankton's extra hammy theatrics and extra small packaging. This is sizest and exhausting! I'm not gonna pretend every individual performance is some gut-busting piece of comedy gold, but the greater majority of it hits the mark no problem. And because there are nine roles to fill between six characters, the game has a lot of replayability because after you play through as one character, you'd probably want to see how another character would react and react in the various scenarios across the special. It's fantastic, and an excellent variable to complement the standard superhero and villain stuff that you're getting every time. As for the voice acting, it's once again insanely solid. Though at this point, I think that's just a given. Every Spongebob game seems to at least have the benefit of the original cast, or at least most of it. So even the worst Spongebob games have some level of authenticity put into them, but it bears repeating. I will never get tired of hearing these good people voicing these characters, TV, movie, or game, because they always seem to have fun in their roles. And considering the heavier emphasis on the story this time around, I'm so grateful that the main six are all voiced by their original talent. Yes, even Clancy Brown. Even better, this extends to the vast majority of the other characters. Every single one of the hosts has their show's actor, which admittedly isn't as hard as it sounds when you realize more than half of them are voiced by Dee Bradley Baker, but it definitely reminds me of his impressive vocal range. Tim Conway for Barnacle Boy is always a ton of fun. That wasn't a hot dog. It was the arm of the chair, you old coot. Charles Nelson Riley was the original voice behind the Dirty Bubble in Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy 2, and they brought him back for this game. He still does great despite this being a good five years after that episode was released. Let's invite our new chum to my lair. We can concoct our evil plans over herbal tea. Oh, oh, oh. 
This marks the first time Bob Joles would play Man Ray, who's been voicing him ever since, and he leaves a very strong first impression here. I got caught jaywalking. Could you believe it? Of course, we aren't allowed to have a perfect cast, for whatever reason, and the odd one out this time is Mermaid Man. That is disappointing considering the amount of focus he gets in this game, and if they had brought in Joe White to perform him like he did in battle, that could have been a big problem. But you know what? They didn't pick him. They brought in voice acting veteran Joe Alasky, someone you might know best for his performance of numerous Looney Tunes characters throughout the 90s and 2000s, and he does a fantastic job as Mermaid Man. All right, there's not much left to say, but to the window washing platforms on the side of the Sea Needle building to rescue Bikini Bottom from the clutches of the evil sneaky hermit, away! Obviously sounds notably different from Ernest, but it's a good, constantly entertaining performance nonetheless, and that goes a very, very long way. Last but not least is our new character for this game, Gil Hammerstein. I'm honestly kind of surprised it took me five Spongebob games to have a chance to talk in depth about a new character made solely for a video game, but here we are. I mean, I get it. People come to Spongebob games to hang with the characters they actually know, so it's a pretty gutsy move to have a new character drive the story and get so much focus, but I'm glad they did it because Gil's a ton of fun. You'd think a shark in the entertainment industry would be pretty fierce and unpleasant, but no, Gil's a pretty chill guy. He's just trying to make the best special he can while dealing with his bitchy executive higher-ups, and it's as relatable as it is humorous. As mentioned, his interactions with the various hosts are either really quaint and laid back, or very entertaining and manic. And this is all brought to life by Norlin North, the man behind Nathan Drake and Deadpool, so... Yeah, needless to say, he does really well in this role. Yes, sir, and the most popular contender overall will get the coveted super villain role. There's a bunch of other small touches and top tier jokes I could show off, but I don't want to reveal all this game's cards. But that does go to show how much there is here. Overall, the story goes way harder than it needed to for a SpongeBob game, and especially for a party game, and I give it a lot of credit for both trying something different and succeeding at it. It's got a ton of laughs all throughout, it gives way more than just the expected cast some time to shine, and it basically comes packaged with a hilarious half-hour TV special where you swap around character roles. There has never been another party game I've played where the story was such a driving force behind the gameplay and where it contributed so much to the game's overall quality. And for that, Lights, Camera, Pants has the honor of having the best story in a party game. Not the most prestigious award, to be sure, but it's something this game can confidently wave around nonetheless. Moving on, we come to the visuals. If you remember what I said in my Truth or Square video, I pinpointed the trick to making an appealing looking Spongebob game. When it comes to this series, graphical quality and technical aspects don't matter nearly as much as aesthetics. Obviously, your game shouldn't look like a crusty dishcloth, but average or even below average graphics can be saved by a timeless visual style. And Spongebob games are quite familiar with this practice, but none more acquainted than this one. Because lights, camera, pants on a technical side is pretty rough around the edges. The character models of the main six in gameplay are actually fairly well done and animated nicely, and a fair amount of the environments look alright, but any other 3D character models that are in the minigames usually look pretty dang sad. Like, we veered far off from what the extras looked like in battle, and now we're back firmly in Flying Dutchman territory. This game also has a lot of what I call Mario Party 3 shortcuts, where a fair amount of the background elements, characters, and even items and objects within the minigames are very obviously 2D images. And it's just so obvious most of the time. I mean, hey, at least sometimes the 2D images will move around a bit because sometimes they're stiff as a coffin. The most egregious example are the scenes where Gil is talking to one of his talent scouts, because we get a comparison of what's clearly a 3D model meant for this game's cutscenes and something else. They're obviously 2D, but they're designed to look like they're 3D models to try and trick people, but while Gil's mouth moves very fluently as he speaks, anyone else talking looks like a Game & Watch character. It's very telling that the best looking host in the game is Karen, because all they had to animate with her was a line. Again, I'm not super bent up about the graphics, but this was released in late 2005, and games with cartoony aesthetics at this time could look as great as Kingdom Hearts 2 or Conquer Live and Reloaded. With all that said, I still really like the looks of this game. Even though the things I brought up are are kind of distracting, it doesn't really matter when playing since you're not really going to be focusing on stuff in the background. And more importantly, the stuff you are supposed to focus on usually looks pretty good. 
These character models look good in action and definitely shine the brightest when looking at minigames with specific animations, like with Jig on the Brig, Rock Bottom, and Machine Meltdown. The color choices are positively vibrant, with Spongebob, Patrick, and Krabs in particular looking a lot less washed out than they did in the first two Heavy Iron games. And I think the cutscenes are a really good showcase of how good physicality and expression work can help pave over its less polished technicals. Like, watch the scene with Spongebob as the sneaky hermit again. Notice how his character model here isn't quite as refined as it was in the Heavy Iron games. There's a lot of obvious clipping issues going on where his eyelashes and eyelids keep disappearing, and you can even see where the top of his iris gets completely cut off while the iris itself is also pushing outside where his eyeball is. But on the other hand, I think these slightly wonky character models and occasional jank are a more than fair trade in the name of super expressive characters. Look at this body language. Look at how things can go off model when they need to in the name of comedy. And look at how energetic and lively they can be animated when they need to be. And I'll say it right now, this has way better character animation than either Truth or Square or Rehydrated, hands down. Sure, looking at individual frames, I prefer the looks of those games way more, but in motion, this game moves most like the show, which is kind of a big deal for a game based on a cartoon. And I'll totally stomach Mr. Krabs' extendable legs for that. Overall, the game looks pretty good. It's definitely not in the ballpark of what a 2005 game should ideally look like on the graphical side, and it has more obvious faults in either battle or the movie game, but it brings itself back into the green for simply looking really nice and lively. I can't stress enough that great character animation helps make these mini games and completely elevates these cutscenes, and that's worth the sloppiness. Honestly, in some ways, it probably is partly due to the sloppiness. It's not like anyone's coming to a party game to be blown away by some 4K flawless presentation anyway, so really, LCP nails exactly what it wanted to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, hey, this is post-production paleography, unscripted over here. Over the course of the video, there's a chance you might have noticed some weird things going on on the edges. I initially didn't write about it in the script, but I decided... I probably should bring it up a little bit just so I can kind of explain myself and kind of cover up for the game. Basically if you look to the edges you'll see a lot of weird things going on. You'll see moving text suddenly stop before going completely off the screen. You'll see minigame environments kind of cut off weirdly before it gets to the side of the screen. You'll see other weird oddities. Basically this game was developed with a 4x3 aspect ratio in mind. As a result there's just a lot of stuff that that a widescreen version of this game just wouldn't account for. And yeah, it is unprofessional, it's kind of cheap looking. I was initially not going to talk about it for two reasons. One, because this game was developed with a 4x3 aspect ratio in mind, so when you're playing the original game on its original form factor, you're not going to notice this stuff. And two, while it is kind of distracting, it isn't so bad or so egregious that it actively ruins the game or even hinders it. It's, it's annoying, it's a little distraction, but it's just kind of like this was part of the times there's plenty of games with little visual oddities that you just weren't meant to see on a 16 by 9 aspect ratio so yeah that that's that if, if you see any of that stuff like i did i did notice it i did clearly i noticed it enough where i felt like throwing this in real quick just because i knew there was going to be a few people that probably noticed it over the course of the video and were like wondering if I had noticed it or if I was going to bring it up. So yeah, it's there, it's annoying, but it's not so bad that it's an active problem. Okay? Okay. Alright, back to scripted me now. Now we arrive at the music, and it's mostly really solid. Composed by Hamilton Alstad and Charlie Brizzett, the latter of which was behind the music of Jimmy Neutron, this soundtrack is just about everything I'd want from a party game OST. Plenty of variety in both genre and tone, and plenty of quality tracks to go around. Getting to that Jimmy Neutron influence right away, it's clear that Brizett was in his element when it came to rock. And you can see that influence in tracks like Pillow of Honor, Charge, and Breaking Out. But there's a whole lot more to this OST than just good rock. Most of these tracks are actually just a minute long and looped throughout the minigame, which works well enough, but I'm quite fond of how Flippin' Out and Jig on the Brig do it, for taking a minute long loop of music and upping the speed and intensity each time the minigame decides to pick up the pace. That's a great choice, especially for Flippin' Out. Also, Jig on the Brig is an absolutely lovely remix of the show's main theme, and it's a joy to listen to every time. Speaking of remixes, I could bring up Loot Scootin', a jazzy remix of Drunken Sailor. I love that one. 
Some less expected genres work their way into the soundtrack, with Seahorse Stampede being a fun Latin-inspired track, while Jellyfish Swish mixes jazz with country for something very laid-back yet very catchy. And catchy is the only word I need to describe Florid and Jellyfish Jamboree, which are some of the most jubilant and fun to listen to songs from any Spongebob game. However, I think the real stars of this soundtrack are the main theme, Gladiators, Mother of Pearl, and of course, Rock Bottom. The game's main theme is a masterful rock piece backed up by brass, and it hits so hard. Somehow perfectly acting as both a superhero theme song and a party game opener, letting you and your friends know you're all going to be competing hard for this spotlight. Gladiators is an orchestral march and fits the combat arena style of the minigame very well. You could sneak this track into Super Mario Galaxy and no one would notice a difference. That's how damn good this one is. Mother of Pearl is this delightfully upbeat arcade style track that works wonderfully when paired up with the minigame that's literally just four-way pong with a mystifying opening. And Rock Bottom is the crowd favorite track from this game and I'm no different. Fitting that the Guitar Hero clone minigame has some really great music, this track is split into six different mini songs and each one carries its weight and then some, starting with the Sea Shanty style take on the main show theme and ending on the game's triumphant main theme. There's not much to say really, if you've played this game you know this song's awesome. I love how it sounds a little different each time depending on the characters you're playing with, but please check out the full version on YouTube that incorporates all six instruments because it really is something to behold. And the solos are incredible, but I'm sure that could have gone without saying. Anyway, let's have a listen to some of these. That said, for all the bangers in the soundtrack, there are a handful of letdowns. Tracks like Order Up, Surf Rescue, and Rebel Rabble are perfectly serviceable and fit the slower paced, more mundane nature of their respective minigames, but that doesn't mean they're any fun to listen to either in-game or while binging the soundtrack on YouTube. Like, cool, I really feel like I'm in prison right now. And then you've got the Tide Piper and Machine Meltdown, which aren't awful tracks by any means. The latter is actually really good, but suffer from there being way too many loud sound effects and too much talking that drown them out, and that really sucks considering how the audio mixing is just fine for the majority of the game. It's not enough to cancel out all the good this OST does everywhere else, but it's still worth criticizing. Overall though, the music's pretty great. It's definitely not on the same level as either BFBB or the movie game, but it's still a very solid A tier soundtrack to their S tier. If nothing else, it still stands head and shoulders over Fishing Insanity ASMR or the Recycling album. At last, we arrive at the gameplay, and... Well, what you see is what you get. Playing as your favorite Bikini Bottomite, you and up to three other people play through 24 minigames in hopes of coming out on top. You want to get as many roles as possible across the special, but the grand prize is the supervillain role. The 24 minigames are separated into 8 different themes based on location, and to simply win a role, you have to have the highest cumulative score across 3 minigames, while the sneaky hermit role is given to the player with the highest cumulative score across all minigames at the end of the game. This is a really solid system for what this game wants to do, as it allows for competition on both a micro and macro level. Sure, after a tense set of 3 minigames, your friend might have snuck away with a minor role in one of the first locations, but in the grand scheme of things, your point difference won't likely make that much of an impact by the end of the game, so you know you can make it up later if you can just crush the next handful of minigames. And before anyone asks, no, the score you actually get in the minigame isn't really what you get. The maximum amount of popularity points you can get at the end of a minigame is 5,000, which is fairly converted from whatever score you got from the minigame itself, which was definitely the right way to go when you consider the massive point differences between what would be considered an optimal round of each minigame. So Seahorse Stampede is no less important than something like Rock Bottom. I know I've made quite a few references to Mario Party at this point, and spoilers, I will continue to bring it up when it's relevant, but in actuality, 
LCP is far from what I'd call a Mario Party clone. There's no board game shenanigans to come back to after minigames. The gameplay of this is 100% composed of minigames, which I'm going to say is an inherently neutral statement. Calling a party game a Mario Party clone honestly doesn't impact my judgment because, let's be real, that series kind of nailed the formula as soon as Mario Party 2. The board game element, the minigames disguised as short bursts of fun, action, and hilarity to break up the board game stuff, and the exceptional balancing act between skill, strategy, and luck has proven itself as the definitive way to make a party game. If another IP wants to use this template, that's fine by me, because it really depends on how good the game is on its own merits. Same for a different take. I'm all for it, but just because a party game doesn't take the Mario Party route doesn't automatically make it better. So looking at LCP, it's safe to say that the question of is this game actually good or not is going to be answered by the minigames. For all the praise I've given this game so far, it ultimately won't matter much if the minigames are mostly either boring, frustrating, or just not fun. But thankfully, LCP's minigame collection is mostly very solid. What we have here is 30 minigames in the forms of 4 player free for alls, 2v2 team ups, and a couple of dual minigames. Most of which testing either your timing, memorization, cooperation, reaction speed, or straight up mechanical skill, and are a great deal of fun regardless of if you're going at it alone or working with a partner. With all that said, because of the fact there's only 30 minigames, and also just because I felt like it, I decided to talk about every minigame in the form of a ranking. So consider this my worst to best ranking of all the minigames in Lights, Camera, Pants. Let's, let's, let's go. <laughs> Tied for last, ironically, are the two tiebreaker minigames, Rock, Paper, Scissors, and Two Up. In a game where every other minigame is relying on skill, these two stand out in the worst way possible by being completely up to luck. I get why they would include them, you gotta throw in a little luck somewhere, but it's not a great feeling to leave your shot a roll all up to chance because you and another person got perfect 5000s in each minigame. Or, better yet, you and the same person were put together all three times in the trio of 2v2s at either the Krusty Krab or Downtown. It's not even a fun, tense kind of luck like with Bowser's Big Blast or Pitfall. It, it just kinda happens. If I had to pick which one I prefer, I'd begrudgingly pick Rock, Paper, Scissors for being an admittedly clever callback to Frankendoodle, but that's about it. Both aren't fun to play casually, and certainly aren't fun to play when there are actual stakes involved, but thankfully you can usually just ignore these ones. So now that we're to the actual minigames, the worst was relatively easy to single out. It's awful, no question, and while I am going to rip into it shortly, I think this minigame is actually the perfect example for me to explain the fundamental differences between minigames in this game and most Mario Party games, and what inherent advantages and disadvantages it has as a result. Barring a few infamous examples, Mario Party minigames clock in at a minute or less, whereas the average audition in this game lasts for three minutes. This would theoretically allow for overall more complex and dynamic minigames, and usually it does. Comparing the likes of Beats Me and Floret to Mario Bandstand and Cartwheel shows there's a little more going on in the former group, and a large majority of LCP's minigames do implement changes partway through to spice things up. Plenty up the overall speed every minute, some just up the overall difficulty as it moves along, others have bonus rounds that give nice short bursts of excitement, and so on and so forth. Not every minigame does this, but those exceptions tend to be interesting enough to not require it. With all that in mind, it would be wrong to say these longer time limits allow for more technical minigames, more like they require it. Because let's be real, you can make practically anything simple into a Mario Party minigame because it'll probably just be a quick, enjoyable 30 seconds. Imagine playing minigames like Cake Factory or Pokey Pummel for 3 minutes straight. That would get really dull, or painful, or both. And I know that for a fact because Machine Meltdown is exactly that. You and a teammate have to constantly maintain an assembly line's worth of machines to keep scoring points, and you do that by button mashing. For 3 minutes straight. That's it. Oh, and if that wasn't bad enough, if you're listening to this the whole way through. What's this? This will only take us out. Look out! That being cute, your generator is starting to wear. Yeah, not a great combo. It's close to tolerable when playing with a squad of four people, but if you decide to play with easier AI opponents, be prepared to spend the whole game listening to Karen scream every five seconds about the other team's generator. This is easily the blandest and simultaneously most irritating minigame in the package, and it's a really bad way to start the second half of the playthrough. Thankfully, it'll only get better from here. Fitting that we're following up on the minigame that comes closest to sensory overload with the one that comes closest to putting me asleep. The bouncers is all about you and your partner bouncing items from one side to the other, and it's really, really boring. It attempts to switch things up a bit by increasing the overall speed and the pattern that things come at you every minute, but it doesn't really do much to throw me off, or anyone I play with for that matter. 
Also, this is one of the few minigames that steps outside the standard 3 minute timer and is instead 4 minutes. And that extra minute really helped to make this already low tier minigame even more bloated and unwelcome. Well, it's just as mundane, but at least it ends faster. Wait and See is all about helping your lifter collect the appropriate weights for any of the sets listed and then properly timing your button press while it's in the green to succeed. It is kind of fun to compete with opponents for the weights, and I do like how the game ends as soon as one team gets all their sets done. It usually deals a crippling blow to whoever came up short in the race for the lookout roll. This one is mostly okay, but what really sinks is whenever you're playing this with AI teammates. The AI is fairly competent in most of the 2v2s, but this is easily where they're at their least reliable. Like, come on, really? Order up is... fine. Players will either be taking orders or filling those orders in, with the team getting a big bonus when an order is fully completed. It's a perfectly tolerable 2v2 minigame that at least introduces the concept of switching roles. Halfway through, you'll swap places with your partner, which at least does a good job of splitting it up so you don't get too bored. But when all this minigame tests is if you can remember three button inputs and if you can follow directions via image, chances are you'll still be kind of bored. The AI can still mess up a bit too much for my liking, but it's not nearly as egregious as wait and see since you don't have to go through that much effort to reset. At the end of the day though, this is just a very vanilla, unremarkable. 2v2. Tide Piper kind of bugs me just on the basis that it's one of the only 2v2 minigames where players have different roles but never swap them. I'm not especially fond of that because, like I said, it would certainly help split things up and help prevent things from getting too stale, but getting past that, this minigame's okay. In a field of constantly respawning jellyfish, players either have horns that make all jellyfish within range of their team's color, or nets to catch those jellyfish. This minigame is definitely more involving than something like Order Up, with players with the horns needing to balance both offense and defense by honking on as many jellyfish as possible while stunning the enemy team to either make them lose all their jellyfish or prevent them from doing the same to your teammate. The netter, meanwhile, has to be really good with the routing, as they have to consider where their piper is, where the enemy piper is, and where their team's cage is as it circles around the arena. It's a great concept that sometimes leads to fun rounds and sometimes turns into three minute long death loops where both teams will just keep honking at each other and no one will actually score any meaningful points. And on top of that, the netter can be stung by jellyfish not their color and you've got to worry about periodic visits from King Jellyfish where he'll just wreck the flow by homing in on the players, zapping large portions of the field and abducting jellyfish from both sides. Put all of that together and it leads to what can be a frustrating nightmare where there's too many factors, too many ways to get screwed over and leads to some fairly low scoring games. Great concept, but it should have toned down the hazards at least a little bit. Finally, we get to the auditions I can consider not bad. Granted, I'm not necessarily looking forward to them in a playthrough and I'm not playing them for fun in the free play mode, but this next group is ultimately harmless starting with Surf Rescue. Besides stretching way too far for that pun, nothing about this is send-worthy. You know Castaways from Mario Party 1, that fishing game no one likes because of the control stick spinning and extremely unforgiving need for accuracy? Well, this is basically that, but without those problems. Items will keep washing up on the shore and you've got to reel in as much as possible. The gauge signifies how far you'll cast with these color-coded buoys to help you out. Reeling in is completely automatic and your hook does a decent job of homing in on nearby stuff, so you don't need to be super super precise. So there's no real frustration, but it also means there's very little going on. Ideally you're supposed to wait till the items get further out since they'll be worth more points, but I've never played a game of this with players or AI where everyone isn't immediately casting out for the easy 10 points. Not to mention, there's a lot of dead air in between tidal waves, which isn't exactly entertaining. Honestly, the only reason I don't dislike this one are the beach ball bonus rounds. These not only offset the low scoring for the rest of the game, but they actually spawn in at various distances, meaning it's the only time where you actually have to be good at judging how far your cast should be. But still, that's like 40 seconds of entertainment in an ocean of blandness. As the reward for beating the gold trophy run of story mode, Tethered and Weathered is pretty weak, but not really bad. You and your partner have to collect as many clams as possible, with one player acting as the anchor and the other one having a total fit in the wind. It's actually a pretty solid idea for a 2v2, but the problem is the controls for the player in the wind. It feels way too sloppy, and that's if your partner was staying still. When they move, your altitude is nearly impossible to keep stable, and it just makes collecting clams a pain. And while I get the idea of you having to throw your collected clams down to the grounded player so they have a more involved role, the problem is that the enemy team can pick up your dropped clams, which gets really annoying after a while. Especially because throwing the clams also doesn't control that well, mainly because you're using the control stick to try and maintain yourself in the air. Imagine playing parasailing from Mario Party 4, but you had to toss your collected coins down to the boat to actually keep those coins. And the enemy team could steal them. And the handling was twice as bad. 
and the wind shifted every 15 seconds. I've had a decent amount of fun with this minigame sometimes, and I do like the unique kite designs for each character, along with the fact that this is a 2v2 where you actually switch roles, but usually I'm just playing this for the sake of unlocking loot scooting. Between two of the best auditions in the whole game is something perfectly serviceable. Pedal of Honor is all about jumping ramps, performing tricks, and scoring big. And that's about it. This is one of those three minute auditions that doesn't really do anything to spice things up, unless you count the addition of the medium and large ramps that allow for more airtime, which I really don't, considering you'll start running into them not even a minute in. I like how you have short, medium, and long tricks that you can chain together however you want, with each combo having its own radical stunt name and point value. And it does lead to some fun competition as you try to outperform your rivals while not getting so cocky as to wipe out, which is fairly punishing as you'll not only receive no points, but you'll have to spend some time regaining speed. In practice, however, I often find myself just using the same high score combos repeatedly for the whole audition, and that could be a me problem, but it's also undeniably the easiest way to ensure a high score, or at least high enough to get the full 5,000. And I just can't get over that. The other trials of Mrs. Puff's Boating School always keep my full attention to make sure I'm playing optimally and not making mistakes. This feels like I'm putting my brain on autopilot. It's alright, enough said. Rubble Rabble is essentially a better machine meltdown, which isn't exactly the best baseline to go off of, but it really is a big step up. We once again have a 2v2 button masher, where you'll stop scoring altogether if you fail to manage a main component, in this case the grinder. But this one doesn't have any of the huge gaping faults of that last junk pile. For one, you don't have to listen to an angry bitch from a grocery store the whole way through, and that certainly goes a long way on its own. But beyond that, the conveyor belts will get faster every minute, and the amount of rocks you'll have to deal with gradually goes up as you continue, which does sound pretty standard, and it is, but that just really goes to show just how hard Machine Meltdown dropped the ball. Throw on the second belt so both players don't always have to fight for space, the huge boulders and diamond rocks for some extra challenge, and the green rocks for a quirky little curveball, and you've got something fairly solid. Mind you, this is ultimately just a 3 minute button masher, which this game really shouldn't have had in any capacity and that's what drags this one down, but if we just had to have one in this game somewhere, I'd much prefer how they handled it in this audition. Rope Burn is a weird one. It's the only other 2v2 to not have partner swap roles partway through, which is ultimately what put this one relatively low, and I think that's a real shame because if that one small thing was added in, this could have easily made my top 10. One player is scaling a skyscraper using two ropes that can jump between or to avoid open windows, while the other is at the top, grabbing colored batteries from conveyor belts and sticking them into these mechanical winches that will allow the climbing player to move much faster. This is a great contrast. With the former, it's probably one of the most skill-intensive minigames in the whole package. You move real fast on the battery-powered ropes, so you want to utilize them as much as possible to pass by as many windows as possible, while reacting quick enough to jump to the rope without any immediate obstacles, as hitting one will knock you down a fair amount and waste your time. It can get surprisingly intense, and I can see why the players are isolated from each other, because the game gives you enough to worry about as is. The latter definitely have it easier, but you still gotta try and help your partner as much as possible, so you're constantly making a mad dash between the batteries and the ropes, all while butting heads with the opposing team member, and it can get just as intense, just for different reasons. I really do like the unique roles for this one far more than the other 2v2s with differentiated roles, and I'd love to put this one higher, but I am really bummed out that both players aren't allowed to experience both sides of this one. So we're finally at the point where I'd say every minigame from here on out is, at least, pretty good. These are the minigames I enjoy from start to finish, regardless of whatever smaller issues they may have, and I'm almost always up for a round of any of them, be it in the story mode or free play. And we're kicking off this category with Seahorse Stampede. This game is 2v2 soccer with a twist. That being the titular seahorses you ride upon, which don't actually add all that much. There's not much to say really. You pass, you shoot, and you hopefully score. I say hopefully because the AI goalies are a little too good at blocking shots, and considering how easy it is to gang up on the player with the ball to steal it, it does often lead to low scoring games, which isn't exactly great when it comes to making the point requirements, but on its own, it's a very chaotic flavor of fun which I enjoy well enough. I do wish you didn't have to sit through 10 seconds of everyone resetting their positions every time someone scores a goal, but regardless, it's a solid, competitive audition. We arrive at the grand audition awarded to you for completing all three runs of story mode and demonstrating mastery over the other bonus minigames. Loot scootin'. Is it bad? Hell no. Is it as grand as the developers probably thought it was? Probably not. Stuck within the bowels of the Flying Dutchman ship, 
Players gotta make the most of their time by swiping as much gold from his treasure hoard as possible. This one's a question of how well do you know your own limits. You can collect up to 10 gold bars at a time, but should you really? Not only is your movement speed noticeably decreased the more you're carrying, but it'll be harder to keep your stack balanced as the ship is constantly swaying. And on top of that, there's some cannonballs that shift from side to side to prevent players from just blindly running back and forth, and the occasional visit from the Dutchman himself that really forces you to either hold back or just go for it. I do really like this one. It's got a real good balance between risk and reward, and any strategy is applicable here as long as you do it well, be it going for the short stacks or the huge payouts. It is a little too slow for my liking, and I never get to enjoy it much considering the work you gotta do just to unlock it, but it's still good. Better than a certain other Dutchman related game, that's for sure. It's been a while since we were at the Chum Bucket, wasn't it? A sign of both how awful Machine Meltdown is, and also how that bad taste in your mouth will immediately get washed out with its following minigames. Surface Tension is a real simple minigame to get to grips with. Just pop as many bubbles as you can as they come out of the holes in the ground. While there are way more holes than players, not every hole will always be shooting out bubbles, so you've got to constantly be on the move and decide if it's more worth it to fight with opponents for bubbles, or chain spots if you happen to see another hole close to spitting out more bubbles. If you're fighting over one spot, you need to make sure you don't get too aggressive hovering over the hole, because otherwise you'll fall in and come out encased. Not only wasting some of your time, but your opponents can then pop your bubble for 50 points, which would give them a decent edge in a close game. In addition, you've got some hazardous bubbles to stun careless players, and two different bonus rounds occurring twice each. Bubble Blitz allows players to just go crazy for big points, while the Dirty Bubble's entrance will immediately grab everyone's attention as he takes a lot of hits, but will award 200 points to the player who lands the last hit on him which is honestly the main reason it's not any higher. The fact you basically have a 25% chance of scoring a stupidly high amount of points is, well, kind of stupid. It would be one thing if the Dirty Bubble awarded smaller amounts per stab on him, or if it gave the appropriate amount of points to each player depending on who did the most, second most, and third most damage to him, but the fact that all this work amounts to only one player getting a huge advantage, and that same player can also get it twice, feels a little bullshit. Still, aside from that, this is a pretty good one. So I'm starting off the top half of Inflatable Pants. This one is essentially one big race composed of a ton of mini-races. With every volleyball net you pass, you're awarded points based on what position you were in when you passed it. The more I play this one, the more N64 Mario Party vibes I get from it. Here we have an insanely simple premise that players will naturally understand. Come in first as often as possible. What really gets players' attentions will be the controls, which aren't necessarily bad, but they do have a learning curve compared to most of the other auditions. You're constantly tapping A to inflate your pants to gain altitude, but even if you can't stay up top because of an obstacle or tall net, you can't just stop pressing A altogether because you'll sink rather quickly and land on the ground where you move incredibly slowly and will give you a small delay before you can take to the skies again. On top of that, there's also a notable delay when it comes to any kind of movement, so you'll need to plan your movements a little in advance before following through. The somewhat off controls sound like a negative, but they honestly work in the minigame's favor. The longer minigame length means that even first-time players will be able to adjust and start catching up, but truly mastering these controls will separate merely good players from the pros, capable of weaving around obstacles and slipping in between more devious double nets that start appearing halfway through the game. And the final net offers significantly higher points, and is essentially that better version of the Dirty Bubble Blast point system I proposed in the last segment. Helping that, by comparison, crossing the finish line feels more indicative of skill than who happened to land the very last hit on a boss. It's a solid audition, nothing more to be said. At last, we come to the Sand Stadium, the final location in story mode I've yet to bring up, and for many fans, the best area in the game. And while I still really enjoy each of them, my least favorite of the bunch is is Jig on the Brig. Fittingly reserved for the Simon Cowell of Spongebob, this minigame is essentially Squilliam playing Simon Says with a group. He'll start by asking you to repeat simple singular inputs, but as the minigame goes along, he'll demand streaks of two, three, and four inputs, with the final one cranking up to five. It sounds easy, but you'd be surprised how tough it can eventually get when you're trying to remember AI-generated patterns with a choice of four directional inputs and four buttons. Add in the big bonuses for players who get successful streaks of 5 and 10, and this minigame was designed specifically for the person in your friend group with the best memory. And while I'm most definitely not that person, I can't say this isn't a well-made minigame. I also just love the personality that oozes off this one. I get a kick out of watching the characters performing these various dances, and whenever Squilliam goes for this elegant pose followed by him bashing the jukebox to up the tempo of the song, I can't help but smile. 
For as good as this one is, I don't want to put it higher as I just think the next 13 either have more interesting concepts, are more fun to play, or both in most cases, but don't take that me as insulting this one. Of all the minigames in LCP, Blister and Barnacles is probably the minigame I've come around hardest for in all my time playing it. I used to hate this one as a kid, but nowadays with a lot more patience and skill under my belt, I've come to appreciate what this 2v2 brings to the table. Set on a couple of window washer platforms, teams will be tasked with scraping the many waves of barnacles that fly under the sea needle. While Rubble Rabble might be the best pure button masher, I think Blisterin takes the much smarter path of incorporating button mashing, but not making it the only real thing you have to deal with. To scale the building, you and your partner have to both use the pulleys, but you two really have to be on the same page. If the platform isn't properly balanced, the bucket will slide about, which means scraped barnacles might not end up in the bucket, and if it's going fast enough, it'll bump the edge hard enough for your team to lose a point. I can't stress enough that you and your teammate need to communicate and be somewhat patient with each other if you actually want to win, more so than pretty much any other 2v2 in this game, and I think that's pretty dang neat. I haven't even brought up the blistering bonus you get for clearing away faster than the opposing team, which can tip the odds ever so slightly in the more efficient team's favor. And this huge ass barnacle that acts as the ultimate test for your teamwork and button mashing prowess, and also the perfect curveball as there's no specified time it'll come out. I do have to dock at some points because while it works pretty damn well with four people, it's a little less so when you're trying to work with an AI, but still, really great 2v2 all things considered. Charge might be a lame name for a minigame, but it makes up for it by being very competitive and very strategic. This is a game of territory control, where you want to zap as many posts as possible while trying to make triangles as they'll award you far more points periodically. However, you can only zap posts as long as you've got a charge, something you'll only get from these rugs at the edges of the arena. So you're not only strategizing on what part of the grid to maintain and how best to sabotage your foe's areas, but also what your route should be between attaining a full charge and right before you lose a charge. Add in a couple of power surges where all the point values will be doubled and things will get absolutely wild as you feverishly wrestle for as much real estate as possible. And much like Loot Scootin', there's no wrong way to play the game. You could go for the middle if you're feeling bold, you could try and just maintain the further out sections of the grid to keep under the other player's radar, or you could be a thorn in everyone else's side and just focus on breaking up all your foes' triangles. This easily wins for the minigame that relies primarily on strategy the most, which I very much appreciate, but I do tend to lean in favor of the more action-oriented minigames, so that's why it's not any higher. I'm gonna keep this one short because there's really not much to say here. Jellyfish Swish is a good minigame. You've got to bungee down to catch jellyfish of differing point values. You can choose to either crowd up where the most currently are for a chance of capturing them or hang elsewhere and pray that some new jellyfish come out where you can snag them. While going after the high value pink jellyfish seem important, they absolutely pale in comparison to jellyfish combos. If you can net three or more jellyfish in a single swipe, you'll get an impressive amount of bonus points. And it really gets good when a jellyfish frenzy comes your way, where scoring a combo or two is not that hard provided the other players will give you the elbow room, so either stay where you are or run off to find the perfect spot. The more I think about it, the more I want to compare this to Surf Rescue, where the winner is often dictated by who does the best in the bonus rounds, but unlike that one, Swish is pretty fun the whole way through and never has a moment where literally nothing is happening. It's fun. I like it. Now onto my top 10. It was a really close call between Jellyfish Swish and Jellyfish Jamboree, but the reason I picked Jamboree over Swish was just because Swish did have moments where I wish a few more Jellyfish spawned. Not often by any means, but enough where it did annoy me just a little bit. Jamboree, by contrast, has no shortage to speak of in terms of jellyfish, so it was just enough to win me over. Jamboree is all about catching jellyfish, with the added catch that you only get award points for what you slingshot over your jelly extractor on the other side of this gap. It's such a simple idea, and barring the occasional whirlpool that will sweep up a fair amount of jellyfish and an unlucky player or two, there's not much buildup in this one. You're getting basically the same experience in Min 3 that you were in Min 1, but that experience, while simple, is pretty fun. Much like Tide Piper, you'll only get points for the jellyfish you've properly put away, but unlike the cages in that game, your extractor isn't always available. It's constantly cycling along with the other player's extractors, so you have to be considerate of your routing to make sure you're not way around for it all the time. You could just capture and send over whatever jellyfish you can find to ensure you're scoring with every cycle, but that won't get you that shiny 5 jelly combo bonus. But that has its own risk since you realistically don't have a full net with each and every rotation. There's a lot of split-second decision making in this
this one, and I like that kind of stuff in a party minigame. Hell, if you're not careful, you could easily fling some of your jellies in another person's extractor, which really sucks, but that risk might be worth it depending on the circumstances. This is a pleasant one all the way through, but I'll admit it could have used an extra whirlpool or two in there, because it can be a little too peaceful at times, and it's really the only reason it could only barely break into my top 10, but still, really solid stuff. Okay, so we're officially in the big leagues, the auditions I would put up there with the best offerings from Mario Party. These are minigames I find myself repeating even after a story mode playthrough just because they're that fun to play. And we're starting this last section off strong with Beats Me. What better way to determine the best potential maestro than a pure test of rhythm? Much like Jig on the Brig, this one requires you to memorize sequences of inputs to score but with three key differences that I'm quite fond of. Where Jig on the Brig was entirely focused on memorizing through visuals, here there's a nice mix. You can still look to Squillium for visual aid, but if you're confident enough in your ears, you can just go off the higher and lower notes he plays and roll with that. I just find that really cool, how this is the only minigame in the musically oriented area where you can actually use the music to help you. Beyond that, I'm also fond of how it handles both scoring and player inclusion. In Jig on the Brig, it was very all or nothing. Every player performed every dance, and all it took was one mistake to not score any points. That was a fine way of doing things, but Beats Me shakes things up. Not every player will perform every pattern, but you know who's next based on the colored lights that'll appear. But to know that, you'll have to take your eyes off Squillium, which means you're putting full faith in your your ears to know at least some of the melody. Alternatively, you could just never take your eyes off Squilliam and remember every note he plays, but that might lead to you forgetting something when it's actually your turn. In addition, the scoring is a lot more lenient. Depending on how well the beat is replicated, you'll be awarded anywhere between 0 and 20 points, meaning even if you make a mistake, you can still walk away with a decent amount of points. It feels far more indicative of player skill than something like Jig on the Brig, where a single mistake could be the difference between you coming in first or dead last because of those massive streak bonuses. And by the time Squilliam's up the tempo, this game devolves into high school band class chaos, especially when all four players are called on to play. And it's a great time. The only reason it isn't any higher is because while the game does a respectable job of picking out what your melody was worth maybe 90% of the time, there are moments where it feels like you get a score that is undeservingly high or low for what you played, and it can get kind of frustrating when that happens. Still, this is an incredible audition to end the first half of the game on. Moving on to your prize for finishing the Silver Story mode, we've got Hook, Line, and Cheddar. Easily one of the most unique concepts for a minigame in LCP, this one is all about riding fishing hooks to the surface, all while scoring as many points as you can. One such way is grabbing cheese off the new hooks, but if you really want to be out for blood and be the biggest asshole imaginable, you start hooking your rivals as often as possible. This is where the fun begins. By holding the jump button, you'll make it so that the moment you jump off the hook, it will immediately go to the surface taking any players unfortunate enough to be caught in the way. Getting one player caught is satisfying enough between the points and the fact they'll be out of the way for a brief period, but when you get those hard double wedgies and elusive atomic wedgies, whew. Now that's a heroin injection. Of course, these moments are rare, especially against human players, but that just makes it even better when you actually pull it off. Of course, the cheese is a safe, easy option for players less confident in their ability to hook others, but they are risking getting caught far more often and being out of the game for a large portion of it. But it also punishes players who are too keen on just going for wedgies by making falling below the camera also force you out of the game for a brief period. Throw in the occasional tube field to test players' reactions and agility, and you've got a contender for LCP's most combative audition, and one that's as well-balanced as it is stupidly fun. Keeping it brief, Breaking Out is essentially a better version of Loot Scootin' with none of the drawbacks. It's faster, it's way more aggressive, and it's all about helping Bikini Bottom's tiniest inmates escape jail so they can continue doing short crimes. So case closed. The searchlights act as a more consistent but less immediately punishing version of Dutchman's various hazards, where upon spotting you, you'll essentially be on a timer, where you'll be caught and temporarily detained if you can't escape it, either by losing it yourself or leading it to another player, where it'll start tracking them instead. But even if you are spotted, you won't immediately lose your prisoners until it turns red, so you can save yourself if you're quick enough. And much like Charge, there's only three places to get prisoners from, so there's an element of micro-competition, except this time, there's actual counterplay, because you can just catch a searchlight's attention and lead straight to whoever's hogging up a rope. This is another contender for one of LCP's most combative auditions, and it only gets more hectic as extra searchlights are brought in. I don't know what else to say, it's just really, really good. 
I don't think it's an exaggeration to call Rock Bottom one of the most popular minigames to come out of Lights, Camera, Pants, and I can certainly see why. It's essentially a simplified guitar hero, but with the crowd, the music, these killer solos, all these charming little animations the characters do as they're jamming on their personal instruments, it gives this minigame an atmosphere that makes it immediately stand out. Like, yeah, I can tell the team was especially proud of this one. As for the gameplay, well... I mean, look at it. It's a Guitar Hero clone, and it's good. I like it as a solid test of rhythm, handling visual cues, and the higher difficulties really don't mess around, but there's just not much to say about it. The gameplay is nearly perfect, but it's definitely elevated because of its superb presentation and excellent music track. I say nearly though, because one of its greatest strengths goes hand in hand with a weakness unique to this particular audition. While this one easily has the highest replayability of LCP's minigames due to the fact that each character has their own instrument with their own unique button sequences, the the devs made a very rookie mistake by giving the characters different maximum scores. If everyone plays perfectly, Sandy will always win, Squidward will always lose, and everyone else will tie. Now, to be fair, the chances of you and everyone else playing flawlessly for the whole audition are pretty low, and those minuscule point differences ultimately don't mean much when you consider you can score quite a bit less than the maximum and still get the full 5,000 points in story mode, but this still should have been ironed out, and it's ultimately what kept me from putting in the top 5. Still, this minigame is a crowning moment of awesome that showcases every element of this game at some of its best, and I can certainly see why it's such a crowd favorite. Mother of Pearl is 4-Way Pong. I love me some good old-fashioned 4-Way Pong, so unsurprisingly, I get my kicks out of this one every time I play it. That's... That's it. It's not original, but it is very well executed with good controls and some crazy golden pearl sprees sprinkled in where points are worth double, and it makes for an insanely fun and gratifying minigame. Easily the best audition you unlock for beating a story mode. Not a lot of competition for that, I'm aware, but hey, this one earned it. It's been a long time, but we're back at the Krusty Krab with the very first audition LCP throws at you. Flippin' out. And if you couldn't tell by its placement, it is a damn fine first impression. The idea is incredibly simple. To earn points, you've got to serve Krabby Patties to a never-ending line of customers. However, because it's a 2v2, it can't be that simple. Teammates must flip the patties over to each other, and you can only score when the receiving player catches what's flung their way. That's really it. Sure, you've got the occasional chum bucket patty that you need to either toss away quickly for extra points or else it'll jump over to your partner and lose your team some points, but for the most part, it's a pure test of reaction time and coordination. You might be tempted to just flip everything as quickly as possible, but if your teammate isn't prepared or fast enough to identify and move to where the airborne burgers are going, you're losing chances to score. And that really sucks in this game in particular because there's 10 in a row bonuses, 20 in a row bonuses, and even perfect round bonuses for those truly immaculate players. And those are typically the difference between the winners and the losers. Normally I'd call that an issue, but this minigame is entirely skill and teamwork based, and even if you're paired with an AI who's just flipping without much thought, you can still catch everything Thing they send your way as long as you're fast enough. And as expected, this is a three minute audition where each minute turns up the heat by significantly increasing the speed of everything. And it really does get more invigorating with each passing minute. The gap between this and Blister and Barnacles should really tell you something because that was a good 2v2, but this is basically perfect. A fantastic way to open this game up. Florida is exactly what I hoped for when I saw that Mrs. Puff's Boating School was the location of this game, a straight up racing game packaged and pretending to be like any other normal minigame. But it's not your average minigame, it is straight up awesome. Taking part in a series of three races, players put their pedal to the metal to finish each as fast as possible, with the final score determined by cumulative time rather than your placement. You've got solid driving controls, a multitude of boost pads, an oil slick to either help or harm you, and three different tracks that utilize different parts of the Boating School course. This could have secretly been a demo for an entire Spongebob racing game, and I would believe it. There's no power-ups, which I'm totally fine with since that could potentially make things a bit too luck-based and give a player a win or loss they really didn't deserve, but you can still go on the offense if you'd like and relentlessly bump your fellow racers around off the track or into hazards, and it can create some fun exchanges between players. This is just the full package, and while the game up to this point was kinda back and forth, this was probably the audition that made my child self realize this was going to be a really good game. Also, don't at me, but this is a way better racing minigame than anything Mario Party has done. I get they don't want to put a smaller scale version of Mario Kart into their party game, but nothing they've tried yet has come close to this. Moving on to my personal favorite 2v2, we've got Flingin' and Swingin', the final audition of story mode and an undeniably great way to end a playthrough. If you like hectic bullshit, this will be right up your alley. 
Strapped together with conjoined backpacks, teams are tasked with going up and down a skyscraper by grabbing these pegs. There are 100 pegs total, and the game will end when either the timer runs out or one team finishes up. When one player is holding a peg, the other can freely swing around to either grab nearby pegs, in which you can swing from one peg to another, or, if you're feeling especially brave, you can build up momentum, and then the other player can let go, and you'll go flying. Of course, where you'll end up depends on how well your teammate can time letting go and when one of you decided enough is enough and grabs back onto the building, or you could just fly off the side of the building and crash. That works too. Not only is this a pretty novel idea for a minigame, but it's just really, really good as both a silly fun time and as a serious competition. This does take a great deal of communication and trust if your team is going to get any real work done, and when the two of you are optimally switching off and swinging fluidly from peg to peg without fumbling, it's one of the most satisfying feelings I've gotten from any party game. At the same time though, there's nothing stopping you guys from just going ham and playing like a bunch of daredevils. You might fall a couple times, but this strategy has its place, especially if you need to get from one side of the building to another really quickly. All in all, this is one of the best 2v2s I've played from any party game full stop. The only reason it isn't my number one is just because while the AI is fairly competent at this one and even allows you to direct them where to swing to, it's ultimately not as fun nor as optimal as playing with real people, which can bog down non 4 human player games that slightest bit. However, that's a very small nitpick in the grand scheme of things. This is really great. What else could it be? Gladiators has gained a reputation as the overall best audition from Lights, Camera, Pants and has topped a few other people's list of their favorite minigames from this game and and really, I'm no different. I don't know how they did it, but they somehow made the minigame on unicycles more intense than the bicycle stunt track and the car race, but hey, I'm not complaining. This is just a no-holds-barred gladiator free-for-all deathmatch on a chunk of land surrounded by water. Each player is armed with a goose squirter. The game's words, not mine. And the goal is to hit and knock your opponents off as many times as possible within the time limit. I called Breaking Out and Hook, Line, Cheddar contenders for LCP's most combative minigame, but they're ultimately runner-ups to this masterpiece. You can either mash A for a rapid-fire burst of weak shots, or charge up for a very powerful shot with high knockback, which both feel really great to land, especially when it leads to someone getting wrung out. But movement also thankfully has some depth to it. While you can freely move around as expected, fast enough to evade shots or chase down fleeing opponents, you also have the ability to break, which sure, keeps you in place, but also means shots will barely phase you and can allow you to stonewall even the strongest of offense. So playing this minigame effectively is a balancing act between skillful shooting and careful movement, all while taking advantage of openings and making plays on the fly. It doesn't end there though. Like many other of LCP's best, we've got big bonuses for consecutive wins. And by getting streaks of 3, 5, or somehow 10 ringouts, you can get a huge advantage over your opposition. The thing is, so can they. So the game also turns into a memory game of trying to remember everyone's current ringout count so you can prioritize whoever's got the highest streak or closest to getting a new bonus, which can lead to alliances that dissolve as quickly as they're formed and usually has one player outfoxing the competition by keeping under the radar. Throw on the tire hazards that can bounce players either off the arena or into other players, and you've suddenly got a powerful tool to assist in knocking your foes off, and a dangerous hazard that can really bite you in the ass if you're not being careful and don't make consistent use of the break. And yeah, with each minute it amps it up by simply adding an extra tire, which doesn't sound like much, but you'd be surprised how much the player's strategies and positioning change based on which minute they're in. As a pure action minigame, it doesn't get much better than this, and it's a massive highlight of any playthrough I've done of this game, be it with friends or even a bunch of computers, and it's an easy nominee for Lights, Camera, Pants' best minigame. So yeah, as you can tell, these minigames are on a very broad spectrum, from amazing, to good, to decent, to merely existing, to awful. But on the whole, I'd say this roster is fairly strong. Over two thirds of it is at least okay in my eyes, and only a handful are what I'd call dreadful, and a couple of them aren't even mandatory plays in the story mode, so it's not weighing the good stuff down that much. I guess talking more in general, if I had to quickly bullet point the strengths and weaknesses of these minigames, it would go like this. The pros of the longer time limits, which ideally allow for minigames that are more dynamic and allow for more complexity. The fact that quite a number of these minigames not only seem right home in Mario Party, which is a compliment mind you, but in some cases are better versions of Mario Party minigames. Games. Flippin' Out is a better cake factory, Surf Rescue is a more tolerable castaways, like I said, Flora drives circles around any other racing minigames from Mario's various parties, Gladiators is a better take on stuff like Bumper Balls and Snowball Summit, Beats Me is a superior Mario Bandstand, I could keep going, but I think you get my point. And I know it's getting repetitive at this point, but the majority of these minigames are fun. 
It's not a very wordy or analytical statement, I realize, but in a party game, that's the difference between being actually good or forgettable trash. As for the cons, I would definitely say that the time limits, while mostly a blessing, do show that not every idea that worked for a 30 second interlude would work for 3 minutes. Shit like Machine Meltdown and the bouncers are either really boring or painful because they take Mario Party concepts from minigames but play them completely straight and don't add anything to mix it up. I will say the pacing of these minigames is a little off at the start. Between the Krusty Krab and Goo Lagoon, you're getting one amazing minigame, one good one, and four that would fail to impress most people. To be fair, I feel like most people would also give the game a little longer to convince them to keep playing, and thankfully they're followed up by Mrs. Puff's Boating School and the Sand Stadium, which are stacked with some of the best minigames, so it does make up for the weak start, but I still wish the game had a stronger first impression. As for the final con, well, I don't know if this is me being too demanding, but I think the count is a little low. Mario Party 7 was released only a month after LCP, and that game had 88 minigames, nearly three times as many. Now, obviously, we are talking about a licensed game made by a third-party developer who likely didn't have the same time or budget allotted to them as Hudson Soft, but even comparing it to the original Mario Party, which was released seven years prior and on a technically weaker console, doesn't do it any favors, since it still managed a respectable 50 minigames on top of all the boards. To be fair, I can mostly excuse the small counts since they were clearly going for quality over quantity, and LCP definitely has a more favorable ratio of good to bad minigames compared to Mario Party 1, but I still can't help but think we could have gotten at least another 3 to 6 minigames. Maybe the devs had plans for more, but just ran out of time, who knows. Don't mistake me, this hardly qualifies as a flaw, because again, the focus was definitely more on making fewer complex minigames rather than a bunch of shorter, simpler ones. And let's be real, more minigames would have likely meant the ones we already had probably wouldn't be quite as good or polished as they are now. And it's not like LCP's minigame count is below average when put up against other licensed party games from the era, so I'm willing to let it slide. With the auditions out of the way, we can finally talk about story mode, the unlockables, and achieving full completion. As mentioned, to win minor roles in story mode, you've got to have the best overall performance between the three minigames in that location set. Except that's not quite the case. For you see, it's not just about having a higher score than everyone else, it's having a score that passes the minimum bar that Gil sets for you. If you can't meet those expectations, Gil will freak out and have you pick between three minigames to replay one to potentially get a higher score. Now, in universe, this actually makes sense. Gil wants to make sure the actors for this big special are actually qualified to perform, so it makes sense that he'd reject a mediocre performer, even if they were the best of the bunch. In practice, however, this can lead to some frustration, since you're being forced to replay something you've already done and just hope you'll do better, which sometimes will be in your control and sometimes won't. To be entirely fair, this isn't really a big problem. While the minimum requirement for popularity points does increase by 750 with each trophy run, the bronze trophy run does only require 12,000 points out of a possible 15,000, so you can have some suboptimal play and still get by just fine. It also means that first time players probably won't have to worry about getting barred from continuing just because they don't fully understand the minigames from the start, and that goes double if you're playing with easy settings and silly CPUs. Yeah, this game has adjustable difficulty settings for both computer players and yourself. With CPUs, it's exactly what you'd expect. When set to silly, they'll make all sorts of mistakes to the point where you'd have to go out of your way to lose to them. Of course, it is a double-edged sword since 2v2s will stick you with one of these toasters, but they are reasonably competent when working with you, barring some of the more infamous examples like wait and see and order up. Medium CPUs will actually put up a good fight and usually do require some genuine effort to surpass in some minigames. Smart AI, meanwhile, are exceptional at these minigames and will absolutely shred you if you're not giving it your best. There's somewhere along the lines of hard difficulty Mario Party AI, but it feels more like brutal if you're also playing on a harder difficulty. While AI difficulty dictates how good they'll be at the minigames, the difficulty for human players essentially means how hard the minigames themselves will be. To be honest, for as much as I've played this game, I can't identify too many minigames where the difficulty setting seems to make a difference. Examples of the difficulty actually impacting gameplay include wait and see, where the speed of the markers will either be slow as molasses or greased lightning, breaking out where how much time you'll have before a searchlight captures you will vary, boulders and rubble rabble will take double the hits to be destroyed if you're playing on hard, and rock bottom and beats me where you're either in grade school music class or setting your guitar hero controller on fire from how fast you'll be pressing buttons. I do like
like these difficulty settings, and I kind of wish Mario Party tried something like this in the future, but it's a cool feature for this game, when it's actually implemented, that is. Ultimately though, unless you're either playing this for your first time or a veteran LCP player looking to prove your skills, I highly recommend keeping both difficulties to medium for your silver and gold playthroughs. Partially because it will make that point requirement detail a non-issue for the majority of your experience, and partially because it will make getting those bonuses far more reasonable. These bonuses are essentially achievements for certain minigames that will net you unlockable goodies for your trouble, and I really like these. Considering this game doesn't have a shop to purchase unlockables like most other party games, I'm totally on board for the system, especially since it gives a single player something else to work towards besides just being the opponents. These are separated into two categories, artwork and action figures. In each location, there's always one minigame that'll have artwork rewards and one for the action figures. With the artwork, it's as simple as meeting a score requirement. Exceed it and it's yours, which I think works just fine. The action figures are a bit more differentiated though. To win one of these, you have to fulfill one specific request as you play the minigame, and this stipulation changes with each story mode run. I have mixed feelings on these requirements though. On the one hand, I appreciate that the devs wanted to not just focus on hitting score targets for unlocking stuff and put forth some unique challenges, and a lot of these are both fun to pull off and not terribly difficult to accomplish. On the other hand, there are a select handful of these challenges that seem pretty ruthless. If you're wondering why I said seem, it's because the game gives absolutely no advice or even a hint as to what these tasks are. The only feedback you'll get is when after the minigame ends, where you'll get a flashing message that you've unlocked something, but if you don't get it, well, you'll just have to try again. To be fair, the artwork wards also give no indication of what the requirement actually is, but at least it's easy to understand what you need to do there. Scoring as high as possible is not some overly specific task you couldn't hope to guess. You're going for high scores in every minigame either way for the sake of winning, so a lot of the artwork will just fall into your hands as a result. Not so much for the action figures. Just to let you guys know, to get an idea of what the bonuses were and to help with my completion experience, I used an online guide on GameSpot by someone named Knuckle Sonic 8. This guide was massively helpful in letting me know what I should be looking to accomplish in the minigames housing action figures, and I couldn't imagine trying to 100% the game without it. And I'm gonna put a link to the guide in the description for anyone interested in completing the game themselves. Knuckle Sonic 8, I have no idea if you're gonna even see this video since it's been 16 years since that guide was put up, but thank you for going through the trouble of testing this stuff out and getting a semi-concrete idea on how to unlock these bonuses. So to be fair, taking a look at this guide and based on my own personal experience, without the guide, a very large portion of the unlockables are perfectly reasonable, especially in the bronze run. Stuff like getting a 5 jelly combo in Jellyfish Jamboree or releasing 3 prisoners simultaneously and breaking it out are not at all hard to get and you're almost guaranteed to get just by playing the game normally. Most of the silver run figures are also not much of an issue with the possible exception of Beats Me, which sees you being the lead by the first up tempo, something that's almost entirely dictated by how competent the AI are feeling for that first round. But the gold figure runs are where the real pain is. Now, being honest, seeing as this is your third playthrough, you should be good enough at this point where a lot of these aren't too bad. Getting a 5 in a row bonus in Goo Gladiators or not getting detained more than once and breaking out are completely acceptable by that point. But how do you like the sound of playing the entirety of Inflatable Pants without hitting a single net? Or going through Beats Me without getting a single oops? That stuff sucks really bad, but at the same time I have to acknowledge that the overwhelming majority of these figures are perfectly reasonable, so a couple of frustrating ones isn't enough to ruin the side quest. What might actually ruin the side quest, however, is the fact that this game also has permanently missable unlockables. To elaborate, the unlockables are separated based on the story mode run. If you beat the story mode in bronze and immediately jump into silver without getting all the unlockables associated with bronze, you'll lose your chance to get them on that file. This. Why, why this? I actually don't understand why the unlockables are designed this way. There's literally no reason for it. The permanently missable coins in Dutchman might have been soul-suckingly obnoxious, but at least you can argue it makes sense considering the dock was wrecked, so anything on the dock would be lost with it. This, however, is a pointless completionist trap, which is one of my personal most hated things a game can do. So, yeah. If you have any interest in completing this game, best to be on the absolute safe side by keeping that bonus guide open and checking the bonuses section of the main menu to make Make sure you're all caught up before getting into a new story mode run. As for the bonuses themselves, they're pretty nice. Well, mostly the artwork. The action figures are neat and all, and I would genuinely buy a few of these if they were real, but it's usually just looking at the rough character models in a cool pose. 
sometimes. But the really good stuff can be found in the artwork gallery, where we've got some of the coolest, most stylistic illustrations of Spongebob and company I've ever seen. Some are Spongebob spins on classic paintings, such as The Birth of Venus, A Sunday Afternoon in the Park, and The Persistence of Memory, while others are stylized movie posters that call back to iconic Spongebob episodes. Pretty much all these are a joy to behold and showcase so many artistic styles that make the high score hunting very much worth it. Besides the bonuses, you'll also unlock one new minigame for winning each story mode playthrough. Bronze gets you Mother of Pearl, Silver gets you Hook, Lion, Cheddar, and Gold gets you Tethered and Weathered. I already talked about these, and two of these are among the best auditions in the game, while the other isn't terrible, so I'll take it. And by getting each of these minigames rewards after your gold run, you'll unlock Loot Scootin'. Get 400 points in that, and you'll unlock the full completion rewards. The Tiebreaker minigames in free play mode, a gigantic golden Spongebob figure, and a Make Your Movie feature, which basically means you can watch the Mermaid Man Barnacle Boy special anytime you want, with free reign to put any character in any role you want. Obviously, I couldn't care less about the tiebreaker games, but the gold Spongebob amiibo is definitely one of the better action figures, and that custom movie feature really is an awesome prize for mastering the game. I don't think anyone will object when I say this game easily has the best rewards for 100% out of all the Spongebob games I've covered so far. And that was Lights, Camera, Pants, a licensed party game that honestly turned out way better than it had the right to be. The graphics, while subpar and loaded with oddities, is saved by the aesthetics, which are bright and colorful, and the character animation, which is dripping with personality and showcases a level of cartoony movement that no other Spongebob game seems to have. The soundtrack is incredibly well-rounded, with plenty of banger tracks and nice variety all throughout, but the best part about LCP is how it diverges from party game traditions and manages to not only be original, but be really good in the process. For once, a party game story is a huge, instrumental part of a game and is far more than just a flimsy excuse for merchandisable characters to get together. It's not only really funny and does a perfect job of justifying the minigames, but it actually makes some of the best use of lesser utilized Spongebob characters and locations I've seen yet. And the half hour TV special you get on top of all that is just the icing on the cake. As far as the gameplay goes, it decided to not just be another Mario Party clone like most other party games released during that time and was leaving it all up to the minigames. While they're not all winners, I'd say more than enough of them are good enough to make this game worthwhile. And the story mode puts those minigames in an interesting point system, which could be fun regardless of if you're playing with friends or computers. And while the bonus rewards have their own issues, I still enjoy having them to spice up single player games and the rewards themselves are pretty worthwhile. Of course, the game isn't perfect. The bonuses aren't exactly well handled with non-existent advice, a handful of frustrating requirements, and the potential to lose these rewards forever. Sure, a lot of those problems can be circumvented if you're using an online guide, but it'd be better if this was just properly communicated within the game itself. As much as I love this game's presentation, it does have some small blemishes I can't get over, such as the poor sound editing that drowns out the music in the Tide Piper and Machine Meltdown. And of course, while most of the auditions are fun, or at least tolerable, there are a handful that most people just won't like either because they're boring or focus on ideas that won't work for three minutes straight. It's not flawless, but I wasn't asking for that for a party game. I just wanted it to be good. And Lights, Camera, Pants is good. Great even. It was unlikely to beat out Battle, but it's got a respectable position as my second favorite Spongebob game, being out even the movie game in my eyes. Now if only THQ Nordic had some interest in making a new Spongebob party game, because I would be all over that. Or maybe just giving this game the rehydrated treatment with some tweaks to the older minigames and introducing some new ones. That could be really cool too. As is though, I can recommend this game to anyone who's a big Spongebob fan or a fan of party games. It's definitely a worthy substitute if your friends don't feel like playing Mario Party, and even that doesn't Feel like a strong enough compliment because I'd much rather play this than a fair amount of the numbered Mario parties including 1, 5, 8, 9, and 10. So yeah, great Spongebob game and it wins my vote for Spongebob's best multiplayer experience and the best licensed party game I've played so far. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and liking the video. It was good to get back to a Spongebob game and while this video was way longer than I anticipated, I think it came out very well. Next time I'm down in Bikini Bottom, I'll be talking about Creature from the Krusty Krab, a game a lot of people want me to check out, and a game I've never actually touched despite owning it for more than a year now, so hopefully that goes well. And hey, if you made it to the end, thank you. Thanks for listening to some rando talk about a children's party game for over an hour. I appreciate you sticking with me through all this. Maybe comment down below and tell me what you think about LCP. I'm actually really curious to see how people feel about this one. But anyway, this has been Bailiography, and I wish you all my very best.